It is now, there should be a thing up there that says this meeting is being recorded and you'll go ahead and accept that. All right. Um, with that said. Computer stop. Did it, is it still going? Can everyone see it still? Mm -hmm. All yes. right. Okay. So as a reminder, if you would all uh, go ahead and mute yourselves, that way we won't have any background noise. Also right. in the, the chat will be used for your questions. So if you uh, would limit your use of the chat, except for questions to the moderator. Okay, thank you. All right. Thank you, Paula. Um, so tonight we're going to start with uh, the Pledge of Allegiance, Scout Oath and Law and Outdoor Code. Chandra is going to lead us in that. Um, and then she'll introduce our presenters for tonight. Um, and then for the next hour, uh, we will have a featured presentation for the evening. Um, at the end, we will have about 15 minutes or so for question and answer. Uh, so we'll go ahead and proceed to the uh, Pledge of Allegiance and the Scout Oath and Law. Chandra, you're still muted if you're trying to talk. I'm, I'm just going to keep talking then. Okay. So if you all could join me in the Pledge of Allegiance where you're sitting, um, if you're in uniform, scout salute, otherwise hand over your heart. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America. I think you put me back on mute there. Okay. All right. Now you're on mute, Matt. <laughs> okay, there we, really, we go. Sorry. We have done this before. <laughs> yeah, I'm just trying to admit all the people as they come in and, and do this too. So um, yeah. do you want to do this again or do you want to go on to the next one? Uh, was I completely muted the whole yeah, time? I was completely <laughs> muted the whole time. Okay, I, I believe everybody did it while they're sitting so we can move forward. All right, we'll go ahead. Okay, Scout Oath, if you'll join me where you're sitting. On my honor, I will do my best to do my duty to God and my country and to obey the Scout law, to help other people at all times, to keep myself physically strong, mentally awake, and morally straight. Next slide, please. Scout law. A scout is trustworthy, loyal, helpful, friendly, courteous, kind, obedient, cheerful, thrifty, brave, clean, and reverent. Two. And then finally, because we are outdoor ethics, we always like to encourage that we recite the outdoor code. So if you'll join me where you're sitting. As an American, I will do my best to be clean in my outdoor manners, to be careful with fire, be considerate in the outdoors, and be conservation minded. So, so thank you to everyone who registered to join us tonight on um, tonight's topic is popular, um, especially given that we have uh, girls involved with uh, scouts BSA troops now. Um, Karen Farrell, who's going to be our main speaker and then Ted Butler who's going to chime in with her as well throughout the presentation. Um, they are both from Sam Houston Area Council in Texas. Uh, Karen is currently the Southern Region Area 3 Outdoor Ethics Advisor. Uh, both Karen and Ted are master educators, Ligna Trace master educators, who completed their course in 2016. I believe Charlie Thorpe was one of the lead instructors on their course down in the Houston area. Um, one of the comments that Karen sent me when she was talking about tonight's topic, she says, I love when people tell me that I take information that can be sensitive and embarrassing and turn it into something fun that they want to talk about. So we hope you guys are in tune to being prepared to enjoy tonight's topic. Um, so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Karen so that she can share her presentation with you all. Good evening, everyone. How is everyone tonight? Go ahead, give me a thumbs up. Hey, I can see two thumbs up. Yay, that's something. 
Again, my name is Karen Farrell, and I started this presentation, and it has been tweaked a lot in the last 10 years. Ted Butler joined in with me. He is a former Army medic, so he also has no shame and can talk about most anything out there. So we're going to get going on this. Hey, I might be able to share my screen, but apparently I can't make anything move. There we go. Course description. I'm not reading it. You guys already got a big hint on what it is, but I have it in there because at some point y'all are gonna have access to this PowerPoint. So I left the slide in. I'm, you're gonna find I'm gonna blow through a lot of slides because I left them in there for you guys if you need to use it in the future. Seven principles, because not everybody knows them. You all do, so I'm blowing past into the fun stuff. Most issues for men and women come in the outdoors come down to just two words. Normally I would ask for feedback and I'd get a whole lot of variety of answers, but the big answer is it's body fluids. Body fluids, yes, your sweat, your human waste, urine and poop, and your blood, mostly menstrual blood in this case. So let's stick with sweat for the moment because we know what sweat is and Again, I'm not into reading slides, so they're there. The bottom one is mostly for the kids to get a chuckle that we would pant like dogs if we didn't have sweat glands. This is a really cool slide I got off the internet and I reached out to the gentleman who owns the copyright on it and he has said we can use this one as long as we do not officially publish it. And it is where I go into the basics and I start to scare people because I start to talk a little bit about organic chemistry. And the idea in educating people on organic chemistry is not so much to teach them about molecular structure and bonds and double bonds and everything else, but to show them that everything comes down to just a few elements out there. As you look with halitosis, we have H, hydrogen, C, carbon, S, sulfur, as the main components of what makes up the stinky bad breath. Underarm odor, again, mostly sulfur, hydrogen, and oxygen, makes your underarm smell like onions and goats and cumin. Oh, how exciting. Flatulence, again, is hydrogen, carbon, sulfur, and a couple of bonds. But the way they come together, you can get some rotten egg smelling, you can get sulfur, garlic, cabbage, something a little sicky sweet. And foot odor, which adds in the element of hydrogen to the mix, which can make it into the pungent, rancid, sour scent we all have been in if we've ever transported young men scouting after a week of summer camp and they think they can kick their boots off in your car on the drive home. Ugh. But the effect of sweat, Obviously, smell. Well, how do we cope with that? The concept of antiperspirants is always really good. There are those who say we should skip it and just smell as we smell. We blend in with nature better. But deodorants are smellable. So the options that are out there, a lot of research, a lot of fun playing. This one intrigues me. It's called Sweat, Bo Sweat Lock. Almost everything I'm going to show you guys is available on Amazon. So if you want to get any of it, you're most welcome to. But the intriguing thing to this one is you apply it to your pits every seven days or as needed, and it will help to block the sweat. Think back to why we sweat. It is our temperature regulator. Do we really want to get rid of sweat? I don't think so, but everything I'm going to show you is an ethic and an option and entirely up to you. There's the lady's clinical strength. If you ladies think you really stink in your pits, this is a good one. But when you put all that sweat in with the folds of your skin, you start to get sticking and friction, and that leads to chafing. And we have all seen young men do that funny walk that looks like they just got off a horse because they're chafing, even though they deny it. They sell chafing sticks now, which is basically kind of like deodorant on a stick. And you can put it on your feet. You can put it between your legs where your thugs, thighs ride together. We all know that feeling. You can put it all over wherever you think you're doing it. Body Glide makes a really nice one, but you could stick with something as simple as Arm and & Hammer and their antiperspirant. There are various powders, but if you think about it, if you put baby powder, talcum powder, cornstarch, any of them into your armpit and you're sweaty and you fold your armpit back and forth a couple of times, what happens? You just get this line of clump and the line of clump effectively falls off your body not exactly beneficial, and then you're introducing all that clump of nastiness 
into the environment when it falls off your body because it's not going to stay there forever. But there are always clothing options. So important thing with dealing with sweat is the fabrics we put on our bodies. We know we keep getting told we should not wear cotton when we're out camping, but they never tell us why. Well, there are a couple dozen different varieties of the cotton plant, and they are plants in that have a lot of cellulose in them. But the organic structure of all the cotton plants and the cellulose they contain are very similar. And you can tell that those are very strong bonds because stronger bonds are the thicker bonds. The weaker ones are pencil thin, but they all have carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. And if you look at the top of those three molecular structures, you'll see in each one carbon, H2O, and hydrogen. H2O is water. And we all know that water likes water. And if cotton's molecular structure has pretty much water in it and you sweat that when you draw bubbles of water on your table together with your finger, they kind of all group together. And it's like a bunch of little high school girls going, ah! and they can't wait to get together with each other. That's what happens with your cotton clothes. That's why it stays wet for so long. And why if you wear wet clothes, you get even greater friction. And then you really get to look like you just walked off a horse. This is where we talk a little bit more about the actual structure of cotton. And it's just some basic information because if people have the background knowledge and information on why things are the way they are, they can make better and more educated decisions. And that's the whole purpose of this, to give people the information so they can make educated decisions. This is where we get into talking about cotton and rayon and what the differences are and where the similarities are. And it's really just good information. Again, it's educational, but I'm not going to go through it all because y'all can read it later. And this is more on the same thing. This is again from the same guy over in England. He's a wonderful fellow, but we're just not allowed to publish his work. Now, they, over there, as Andrew will tell you, football jerseys. Over here, soccer jerseys, same thing. But what we're talking about now are man-made materials. So this is polyesters. And we're all quite familiar with polyesters. And on the upper right, they're talking elastane. Ladies, we all know elastane because it's commonly known as span spandex or lycra. It's that wonderful stretchy stuff that's in all our girdles. And as we get older, we love our girdles because they suck all those stuff in again. It's wonderful. But the other thing to pay attention to on our shirts is that the sponsor's names, the numbers on the shirt are all made with polyurethane. And if we were in a situation right now where it was physically together, I would ask everybody, what is polyurethane? Some of the women would answer and most of the guys would answer, polyurethane is what we use to seal our furniture and our wood. It is effectively the waterproofing we put on it. And we're putting it on our shirts. If we're putting that on our shirts, we're reducing the ability of our shirts to let our sweat go. So it is something to consider when you're out running about. How does fabric tie into outdoor ethics? It's really simple because we're educating people to make ethical decisions. And what I've got here is a set of about six or eight slides on all the different fibers that are out there for clothing. But I want you to pay attention to the second paragraph, the one in the middle, the drawbacks, because it's gonna talk about how the products are made. So you'll know in this case, cotton uses large amounts of pesticides and water when it's being grown, it's energy intensive, in a lot of places around the world, they use child labor, forced labor. And there is a chemical process that can be involved in turning this wonderful cotton plant into the fabrics that we know and love. Here's a similar one for silk, linens, wool, and bamboo. And bamboo is the one I'm gonna stop at at the moment because it's all the rage at the moment. Bamboo flooring, bamboo clothing, bamboo this, bamboo that. How it's wonderful, how it is such a renewable crop and all of that. And while I can't find my original slide, I do know that the processing that happens to turn a bamboo fiber, bamboo stalk into cloth is either three or five times as chemically intensive as it is to turn cotton into cloth. 
And as you read in the drawbacks, the processing of this into fiber is extremely chemical intensive. It is not a closed loop system and may pollute the water environment around it. A closed loop system means they're constantly reusing the same thing. If it's not closed, that means they're releasing some of the byproducts. Where do they release it to? Well, hopefully not the environment, but do we know? No. Viscose rayon, lyocell, pencil, regular nylon, and we're into the manufactured fibers, polyester. And then we cover a little bit on the biodegradability of all these textiles, the manufactured versus the natural, where they all fit in. It's a fun slide to share with people who are really, really into biodegradability, sustainability, and all of that. And the hype, the site for where the site, the site for where the slide came from is on the bottom right-hand side. Where possible, I've included that so you can always go back and look more. But after we've covered the fibers, we get into wicking and explaining why certain fabrics are really good at wicking, what wicking is, and why we want to have fabrics that wick the moisture away from our bodies. Since you're going to be getting this, I'm not going to read it all to you, but the main thing to remember is we call it wicking because as candles draw wax up the wick to the flame, these materials draw our sweat to the shirts for the wind to pick up and carry away from our bodies so that we're not walking around in wet clothing all day. Very important, especially in your undergarments because you wanna keep the stuff that your undergarments are covering as dry as possible. If not, you will have chafing, you will have rashes, you will have things growing down there if they don't change their underwear. You get the idea. A little bit more on biodegradability. And we're gonna get into this a little bit more later. But we wanna talk some about the actual shirts and clothing that we need to wear. So they want us to wear loose fitting, moisture wicking for great ventilation. They recommend the layering, so worn over or under other clothing, the SPF, how to avoid the cotton fibers. And a good thing to remind people of with the cotton fibers is if you're in your front yard, backyard, and you're doing your gardening and your lawn maintenance, it's good to wear cotton fibers then because you're going to be sweating a lot, especially down here in Texas, where we've got such wonderfully cool and calm, gentle summers, 110 degrees. You want the wet because you want the breeze to hit the water on the shirt to help to cool the body. So we don't go into all sorts of medically induced heat related trauma. So go through the rest of that. Pants. A very important part for pants because we want pants that dry quickly as opposed to the wonderful canvas switchbacks that scouts sell to us. Loose enough for your movement, loose enough to have thermals on underneath them in the winter, no cotton. You want pockets, you want to wash and wear, removable legs. We all love the switchbacks for the removable legs, the reinforced seams because who out there hasn't blown a seam at the most inconvenient time on a camp out, really? but you gotta look at the, what the market is putting out there for us. This is an example of what manufacturers put out for women for hiking pants. Well, if I'm hiking and my lower legs are exposed, I've got the chance of getting my legs all scratched up, of critters snitching at me and biting me. They're a little bit tight. I don't see that much by way of a pocket. And the guys get these wonderful, comfy, loose fitting switchbacks with lots of pockets, big pockets. Why are pockets important? When you're out and you're hiking, I don't know about you guys, but I usually have a pocket knife. I usually have my chapstick. I might have a compass. I might have my cell phone. I might have a small wallet with my identification on it. I mean, really, what do these people think? We're carrying our Gucci handbags while we climb a mountain. Not good. Undies, bras, panties, girdles, spanks, thermals, panties. Again, we wanna be away from the cotton. We want the wash and wear. If you get the right brands, they're designed to be odor resistant, moisture wicking, again, keeping the down there nice and dry. Tagless labels are wonderful. 
Anybody who's ever worn a shirt or underpants that have tags in them will tell you that those tags start to irritate and chafe and you wish you could just reach around and cut the silly things off. It's wonderful. Stay in place because when you're hiking and climbing mountains and stuff, the last thing you want is a wedgie. Socks, again, avoid the cotton. Wool is wonderful. All of these things are wonderful for your socks. One of the things I've discovered though, and since I usually aim this more towards women, though guys have been jumping in on this topic more and more and I love it, is the socks. And I love Ingenies. They remind me very much of the 1970s when we had the very brightly colored knee highs that were toe socks also. But what's important about the Ingenies, and I just use the name because it's the brand I find the most often, is they're 55% cotton, I mean nylon, 40% lycra, 40% nylon, 5% lycra. I'll get all that stuff straight. Which means your feet are going to dry. When ladies walk around in heels all day long and all the nice dress shoes that we have to wear nine to five, our toes get pushed in together. And our toes do this. And they start to grow in. And the pinky toe kind of starts to nestle into the toe next to it. And if you don't have separation of your toes when your shoes are doing this to your feet, what you're going to have are hot spots, blisters, and other wonderfully painful situations around your toes. Put these things on, it naturally aligns your toes. It puts fabric in between your toes so your toes move better and your toes need to move. If I can tell you, when I put those things on, my hot spots have gone away and I haven't had a blister in about six years. They're wonderful, I love them, I recommend them highly. Okay, sliding on now into human waste. And I really am going through all of this quite quickly because it's a lot of slides to go through in a very short amount of time. But this is where we explain to people who are not quite sure about the physiology of urine, what it is and what its purpose is. And it's always good to remind people about hydration and urinary tract infections. So what I usually do is I have everybody stand up. So if y'all will just sit up straight in your chairs and put your hands where the hands are of the image. Do that on your body. Tuck your elbows up nice and high like it is. What your hands are now covering are your kidneys. And it's important to know where your kidneys are because if you get a really good kidney infection, you're likely to feel pain. And that knowing the difference between the pain of a kidney infection and the pain of back pain, like you pulled a muscle, you did too much, you've been leaning over too much, cleaning trails and using loppers and everything else. It's important to know the difference. It's important to understand what the signs and symptoms are of a UTI. And also to realize that it could just be dehydration. And this is where we really push everybody, drink, 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 fluid intake, fluid intake and explain to them the things that they likely already know, especially if they have ever staffed a camp because almost every camp out there has the little urine card that people carry around to remind everybody what color their urine should be if they're properly hydrated. And we show various options that you can carry. The one on the left is that really cheap little one that we tend to give kids at day camp. If they're more than a year or two old, they're gonna start cracking and falling apart. The Nalgene's. It's a great history story behind uh, how we ended up with Nalgene's. It's actually a scientific bottle that a guy who works for, and I just forgot the name of the company, sent his kid out to camp with, and it just caught on from there. The bottle next to it really is a collapsible bottle, and it gets down to about, oh, maybe an inch thick, and it is small enough that you can fit it in your hip pocket on your jeans which means every time I have to go to a stadium and watch some soccer game or football game or any such game, I usually have one of those tucked in my pocket because it is so much nicer to have my own ability to go to a water fountain and get water and drink water than to pay $5 for a glass of soda that I really didn't need. And we all know the concept of camelbacks. Hey, that worked. Which of course leads to evacuation because input output. There's a gazillion female urinary devices out there. They're designed to let us stand up and pee like a guy. And I'm just showing you a whole host of them that are out there. The one in the dead center is relatively new on the market. It's only been out for like two or three years. It's called a Tinkle Bell. 
And one of the things the manufacturer pushes on the Tinko Bell is that that back part is soft enough that you can effectively, scrape's not the right word because that actually sounds painful, but you get the idea. And it'll solve the problem of having to wipe. The Nalgene we all know the deal with, the one second from the left on the bottom is collapsible. I have not tried this one. I would worry, does it collapse when it's full? Ooh. P style, very similar to the Tinkle Bell. I'm not sure which one is longer, but I do know that scouters, female scouters I know who like to mountain climb, swear by the P style. They say they can slide it in and void while they're out there climbing the mountains. It's one of the things about this guy is just so you're all aware is, you know, Karen really is moving through these fast. This is a, normally this is a two hour presentation, her and I tag team. But one of the things that we have is typically when we do these in person, Karen has a bag with all this stuff in it and we actually pass it around and people can see these, which is, you know, it's, it's amazing to look at them, to hold them. You know, I was going to say, you know, other than Charlie playing with things, but in general. Oh, that was a whole story. Um, yeah. <laughs> For those but of in you general, who Charlie it's, Thorpe, yeah. he, he interrupted one of our presentations once because we will pass around everything. I, there's a brand of underwear called Balance Tech that I really like. It has all those antimicrobial properties and everything else. We throw underwear at people. We throw tampons at people and they get passed around. Charlie was in the back of the room doing this with the underpants. I lost it. It was bad. So it was entertaining. So, but one of the things I just want you to think about is remember, we're throwing this at you fast. There's a lot of stuff here because these are a lot of slides, but you know, it's a lot different when you're going through it slow. You're letting people ask questions. You're making this a lot more interactive. So, you know, this is designed mostly as a primer for you guys, just to give you an idea of what we talk about when we do this. The one in the <laughs> upper right, I literally just found last week. The Silicon pieces in the front, the purple is for ladies, the gray is for men. They screw into the bags that you see in the back and you void into the funnel, which feeds into the bag. And then those blue latches at the top really are stop plugs. So you would slide it in the instant case from right to left and it would lock the top. So the bags are now sealed. The bags actually from an FDA point of view, because they do list FDA on the bags are probably in some sort of labeling violation because they claim that it's silicon and it's not silicon. They have some stamping on there that is, sorry, I did 19 years with the FDA, it's counterfeit. <laughs> but the idea is really cool. But evacuation reminds me of something because remember I said, that you can slide some of these into their trousers and urinate while they're climbing mountains. Well, this is a pair of canvas switchback trousers off of scoutstuff.org or whatever the website is. And this is the complimentary pair for women. Note where the switchbacks align. Men get a much longer short than women get. But I really want you to focus in on the crotches of these trousers. And if you haven't noticed it yet, I'm gonna point something out to you because that's the bottom of his zipper. That's the bottom of her zipper. And that's a two inch difference, which is something you've really got to look for when you're looking at your trousers and your clothing and your fabric. How much space is the manufacturer giving you to actually do what you need to do? We know why the man's zipper is longer. He's got junk to deal with. But if we're going to be using any of those funnels, we need to think about the ability to access our trousers without having to pull them down to our knees. Which reminds me, because last night I found something on Kickstarter I thought was rather funny. And Ted reminded me that we had these back in the 70s and 80s. But they are delivering a pair of pants for women that provide a simpler, freeing, inconspicuous and discreet lifestyle without the exposure of your bum, your butt, your derriere, your fanny, your gluteus maximus or your tush. Basically they have created a set of trousers that unzip from the back all the way around to the front so that you can squat in either of those directions and be able to either just straight out void or void using any of those devices. 
The other perk to all those devices, as you noted, was some of them have collection containers. So remember that, because we're gonna talk about the collection stuff in a minute. But if you're not doing the front end, you gotta do the back end, which puts us into cat holes. Y'all know what cat holes are, so I don't have to stay here very long, but we need to cover cat holes. I show a variety of trowels when we do our dog and pony show. I think Ted and I have about 13 different types of trowels that we show people and let them play with. Some are the real chintzy ones that if you try to dig in any real soil are gonna fall apart in a heartbeat. Some are titanium, some have hinges and latches. Some are the ones you would use in your backyard to go digging anyway. But some people actually need to sit. Squatting realm does not work. So we all know about the luggable loo and it's five gallon bucket, which by the way, if you're in the market for a luggable loo with the five gallon bucket, I know yesterday I bought one on Amazon and it was only $19.99, so it was a real bargain. But I found a pool noodle is cheaper. If you cut a pool noodle and put it on a five gallon bucket, you can seal the bag in with the pool noodle and have that to sit on. Portable toilets that have been around for decades. It's the only way my mother used to go camping in the 70s. The folding toilets remind me of medical gear. The Biffy bag. We have a great deal of fun sharing Biffy bags with people. If you've not seen a Biffy bag, if you've not played with a Biffy bag, a Biffy bag is effectively a giant diaper that you tie around your waist. It would hang about four, five, six inches from your crotch area, and you are just to stand there or squat there and void right into it, and then take it off, wipe your bum, and properly dispose of it. Having never used a Biffy bag, just laughed at the concept of Biffy bags because I think it is so funny. I don't know how we would dispose of that one. But we know rest stop two. We saw rest stop one on the previous slide. So of course they had to make a rest stop two. Rest stop two, like some other products that were listed under the urine slide, have products in them like poo powder and it helps to solidify the output so it's not sloshing around on you. This one on the bottom right is truly called a try to go. It is a folding stool, bad word in this case, but they call it a camping chair. It's a stool, there's no other feature to it. The top piece has buckles and you can remove it and flip it out of the way. Insert a bag like a uh, clean to go bag and void into the bag by sitting on that stool and then use it as a regular stool the rest of the day so the world doesn't need to know what its true purpose is. And it actually has a weight capacity of 300 pounds, so it can handle the majority of us. Back to poo powder, if anybody has not dealt with it before, one scoop of poo powder is supposed to take care of, what was it, Ted, 28 ounces of liquid? 28 to 32 right in there. Thank you. It really does help to prevent backslash. When we're teaching, we tend to take a fraction of a scoop, put it into a zip top bag, pour water in it, seal the bag and pass it around the room. And by the time it gets to the last person, it's already solid, which is kind of cool to be able to let them see how quickly this stuff works and how good it is. Poo powders manufacturer, which is clean waste, advertises that the poo powder will turn your biological output into a class two landfill safe EPA labeled product that you can just throw in the trash can. Not a bad idea. The go anywhere is a little bit more expensive on their product line because it comes with the bag with the poo powder already in it, some toilet paper and hand sanitizer. I think you can probably do it on your own for a whole lot less money. And when you have to carry it out, those of us who've taken a Leave No Trace trainer class have probably all done the trick with zip top bags and duct tape, but there are also poop tubes. I have a small poop tube I tend to show people. It's literally about six, eight inches in length, about one inch diameter. It is the smallest tube I could get at Home Depot Lowe's to make a poop tube from, and some people look at that thing and they just don't get it. So we have to actually explain to them, one, no, that is not for carrying your tampons because I did have someone ask if that was the purpose. And I had another young man who looked at it and held it towards his posterior and looked at it and held it towards posterior and said, I don't get it. He thought you literally had to poop directly into the tube. 
but we cover the factual reasons to have a poop tube. We cover the building of poop tubes. We cover that you really ought to have a screw top on both ends, not a solid on the one and a screw top on the other, because when you go to put a garden hose in that devil to wash, it's just not fun, it's not safe, and it comes right back at you. But we also remind them the limit on having to carry out your waste is your imagination. Wiping. So we've got your basic toilet paper, and I remind people to go tube-free where they can. It is a whole lot better. I mean, who wants to carry the cardboard? But if you did have to carry the cardboard, it could be a good place to put the bag that you're going to have to carry it back out in, that when you're in a public restroom and you find that the maintenance staff has left a little core sitting on the top of the dispenser for your privilege and use, shoot, take it. It's a great little use because now you've got a real tight wad hunk of toilet paper to take out. We talk about the flushable wipes and we have a package of wipes to just let people play with. And we talk about all the ancillary uses of flushable wipes because they're not just for cleaning your backside. They can also be used to clean your face and anything else on you that gets dirty. They can be used to help a little bit with washing wounds. They're great for blowing your nose, but don't ever flush them. Any plumber worth his salt will tell you that all they do really is clog your pipes. They claim to be biodegradable, but the problem is they'll never get through your pipes far enough to get into the sewer system to start to biodegrade and your septic systems don't like them at all. Bandanas, we always recommend. I recommend using a yellow bandana. And when we're in person, we joke, Ted usually gets somebody to stand up for me and you know, you demonstrate how it would be tied onto a backpack and you don't wanna be doing that with the wrong bandana. <sighs> Kula cloths are wonderful. They're new on the market. They also claim to be antimicrobial and everything else. And as you can tell, they have a whole lot of really, really fun designs. If you're not so into wiping, they're coming out on the market with all these wonderful adapters that will turn your bottle of water into a bidet. So these two are different screw tops that would turn your bottle of water into bidets. So, hey, we finally have a use for those bottles of water that we absolutely hate when people carry because they will crush. And as you can tell by the image of the one that is actually a peripartum cleaner, that you have to squeeze the bottle. If you choose a peripartum cleaner and ones like that, that means you've also got to carry that bottle around. If somebody does choose to use a bottle of water, I do hope they don't go to drink out of it afterwards. Uh -huh. Blood. We talk about it as the river of life, explain to them what it is, what's the purpose of the blood. Again, it, background education is always good. And oh. this yeah, in this area, by the way, folks, is is where you'll have, especially now that, you know, with, with Scouts BSA, we've got more girls out there in the outdoors. We'll have a lot of our, you know, older gentlemen and our young boys that are in these classes and they're just like, you, you see them kind of get very lost and very nervous. So this is a, this is a topic that works for both areas because everybody needs to understand it, you know, so they realize that it's, it's not quite what they think it is, so. And along that line, a couple of years ago, I had my son who was about 15, 16 at the time review this. And he asked that I put this slide in. He said that he is shocked at the number of kids in his age bracket who do not understand what the menstrual cycle is and why it is. So he asked that we put this in. So it's in, if you need it, use it. If you don't, blow past it. But we do kind of stick with the concept of menstrual blood because you need to understand what it is, why it is, and what our sanitary options are. And we go through pads, we talk about all the various sizes, the wings, the, the this, the that. We talk about disposable and reusable. Yes, there are reusable pads out there. Whoa, sorry, previous. We talk about tampons. Do you want cotton? Do you want polyester? Yes, the majority of tampons out there until the last year or so have been made with polyester. Do you want an applicator or not? Do you want what size? Internal cups. There's so much to consider when it comes to 
the products that women use for their sanitary issues. And along that line, there's a long-standing rumor that women shouldn't camp because women menstruate and bears can smell menstrual blood. And if a woman is menstruating, the bears are gonna come and they're gonna kill us all. Well, the Journal of Wildlife Management published some research back in 91 that was really, really cool. And the premise of what they did is they found a woman who was about to menstruate and they convinced her to get in a shark cage out in the middle of a field in the middle of Yellowstone National Forest. And then they pulled back and they left her in this shark cage in the middle of this field in Yellowstone. And yes, as expected, a bear approached. And a bear came up and a bear sniffed away and sniffed away and examined and explored as a bear would with anything that was new to its environment while she was menstruating. And the bear walked away. The bear didn't care. No signs of aggression whatsoever. Kind of cool. Personally, I think it was a very brave woman. Another random fact. The tampons that have been out on the market for umpteen years, they sit, they don't just degrade. And the average woman will use something along the lines of 11,000 tampons in her lifetime. Again, where I got this from is at The Guardian. It is a newspaper in the UK, and this was dated April 27, 2015. But I want you guys to pay attention to this label. The Food and Drug Administration requires all sorts of things on the labeling of products. This particular one is for an OB tampon. OB tampons were actually named after the female gynecologist in Germany whose last names had the initials of O and B in it, but I don't speak German, I can't pull it off. And she's the one who formed the current version of a tampon. Prior to that, tampons have been used all the way back through Cleopatra's era. In Cleopatra's era, it was a cat and nine tail and it was not used for a menstrual product. It was covered in cat dung and used as a contraceptive. And they've been doing things like that for centuries. It's gross. I'm very grateful that our tampons today are as clean as they are. But what I really wanna pay your, focus your attention on is this line right here. Ingredients, rayon and or cotton fiber, polyester with a polyethylene cover, polypropylene cotton or polyester string. That's a lot of polys and a lot of esters. When you see something that's got a, name, a fabric with the name of poly or ester in it, it's man-made. If you'll remember, when we talked about cottons, cottons had H2O, cottons like to cling to other liquids. Polyesters, not so much. So do you really want something with that kind of ingredient statement for your tampon, for what you want to be out there to absorb? We cover the more natural options, or so they say. And cotton tampons, when I first started doing this, were very difficult to find. And this was the only brand I used to be able to find. Well, I went out onto my friendly Kroger about two weeks ago, and all of a sudden, the market is flooded with products made of cotton. There were literally dozens, and I'm sure I got quite a number of strange looks as I stood there at the shelves with all these sanitary products and my phone taking pictures of all the products and all the labeling. But now it's their 100% organic cotton, pure and natural, because what you put in your body matters. Honey child, it has always mattered. Y'all are just catching on because everybody's in COVID and in quarantine, so everybody has more time to think about these things. But even the pads are now labeled with pure cotton. But if you look at the always pure cotton with flex foam, if it's foam, it's not cotton. It says 100% organic cotton. And I think it's top pad, top layer. Sorry, there were faces blocking the picture for me. A lot more products out there that are cotton. Now, the real fun to all of these things that are cotton is the multi-purpose uses of them. Because your average cotton pad, your sanitary pads, we actually owe to a bunch of Red Cross nurses back in World War I. Because with all those soldiers, with all those hideous wounds, they were running around 
frantically trying to take care of all these people with all this blood gushing out of their bodies, putting all these wound care pads on their bodies. They didn't have time to sit and take care of their bodies when it was their time for their cycle. Prior to that time, women literally did just use rags, whatever rag you could find clean and stuff in there you were using, which is actually the basis for that oh so genteel phrase of watch it, she's on the rag. That's where it comes from. Well, these women, a couple of them must have looked at these pads one day and said, hey, this is an idea. And they stuffed those into their panties. And now that is exactly how Kotex came to be, Kotex being the original product. These products are also useful for other things, though, because think about it. If Kotex came from a wound care pad, what do you think tampons and Kotex could be today? Wound care pads. So when you have some of these products in your hand, if you were in need of a wound care product, it's not a bad idea to whip one of these things out. Now, the hard part is most guys, if you throw a Kotex on his forehead when he's bleeding, he's going to freak out that you're putting a sanitary pad on his head. You might need to wrap it in gauze or something to conceal it, but they're wonderful because, as we all know, they've got that lovely peel stick on the back. So you lay it on their head and then you wrap the gauze and the gauze will stick to the peel strip. Yay. Also, tampons. When tampons are manufactured, they're manufactured in two different ways. One is they coil into a circle. The other is they take this strip this long and they compress it. The Nature Care we took out on a troop camp out 10 months ago. Our last camp out was our burn camp out. We burned everything to see what would burn and what wouldn't. I let them play with, a, with cotton tampons. They expanded it. It was really cool how much it came out that long. And then we fluffed it and it stood up that high. And when they laid a match to it, it burned really, really fast. So let's see, we've got tampons for menstrual cycle, tampons that you can extend out and use for wound care, tampons that we all know that if you've ever gone to Philmont, they're great for shoving up your nose when you get a bloody nose. The age old joke, because there was a TV commercial on it years ago where she took out her tampon and shoved it in the hole in the boat and stopped the boat from sinking. There's lots of reasons to carry these things, guys and gals. And now that you can get the cotton ones so much better, I highly recommend carrying that as a part of your be prepared packet. But pay attention to the applicators because the, can the tampons that have applicators have the wrapper and then the plastic applicator and then the tampon. How much do you want to pack in and pack out? One of the reasons OB is good, Nature Care, and other ones is they don't have the applicator. If you're going to use it, you use your finger as your applicator, but it's a lot less waste to carry in and carry out. Other more natural options are bamboo pads. See, the bamboo comes back around to us again. If you've never seen bamboo pads, since I can't throw any at you to let you play with them, you see what they look like when they're semi-closed and when they're fully closed. So semi-closed, the flowery part would go on the bottom of the panties and you snap them in and that's how you would secure them. When you're ready to change out your bamboo pad, you unsnap it, fold one dirty end in one third, fold the other dirty end in the other third, and then fold the two wings back in and snap them. And now you have it all sealed up, nice, secure, and you can just carry it until you get to a place where you can wash it out. So they're really good for that. They're very reusable. But again, if you think on the other end of it, do you want something that's bamboo? Do you want something that's cotton? Do you want reusable? All ethical, ethical decisions. The nice part though too is after you've washed them out, again, if you're hiking and backpacking, hang it on the back of your backpack. It'll dry in the sun as you hike. Silicon menstrual cups. A whole variety of manufacturers out there right now. I think it started with the Diva Cup. When we do our dog and pony show, we've got, Ted, what have we got? Four or five different brands of menstrual cups? At least four, yeah. And we let people play with them. We let people show them. When I first did this presentation at the National Outdoor Ethics Conference two, three years ago, while we were there, Tampax came out with what they said was the best, most scientifically designed, researched menstrual cup designed to fit your body. And they measure it and they claim all sorts of things. 
So we, of course, reached out immediately at the conference to Tampax and explained that we do this dog and pony show. And Tampax sent us a starter kit. Many menstrual cups come in what they refer to as size one and size two. Size one is for teenage girls with very tiny little hips and tiny little hoos and all of that. And size two is for those of us who have already passed a watermelon because once you pass a watermelon, that thing don't shrink back to the size of a teenager anymore. Menstrual cups. As you search for menstrual cups on Amazon though, do be careful because when I did my search for menstrual cups, this little devil popped up. And in the advertisement, it talked about how it's collapsible, which made me cringe. Why would you want your menstrual cup to collapse? And it had a lid. We're saving it. It's actually a shot glass. And it's much bigger than a menstrual cup. So watch your searches when you're looking for things. Oh. And the other is some IUDs. Those of us who have an IUD are familiar with them. There's basically two kinds on the market. One is a five-year, one is a 10-year. The 10-year is marketed as obviously lasting longer, but it can give you greater cramps and a greater flow. The five-year version reduces your cramps and can actually stop the flow. And you can go without having a period for upwards of five plus years on this particular IUD. So it's just a different option if you wanna stop your period because you wanna go hiking or camping or whatever your rationale is. But the hygiene of these things, and this is where we get into, we talk about what the hygiene is and washing your hands and making sure you thoroughly wash all these devices that I didn't do that. When, when a lady needs to use the facilities or whatever to change out her menstrual cup, we remind people, especially the guys who have to integrate with the women and are getting used to these things, that the silicon menstrual cup is very similar to putting a oil cup in a, a vessel and silicon and liquids kind of stick and they form a good seal that you have to remind your young ladies when they're practicing with these things that they need to break the seal first. Otherwise you're gonna hear her scream because it would hurt. And all the cleaner concepts. Nocturnal issues. There are some again who say, why do this tie to outdoor ethics? Think about it. All right, we get, women get colder at night. If I slide into we gets, because I usually do this to all women, but I'm glad to see guys are coming out for it because they have similar issues. Use a sleeping bag, get off the ground. Those couple of inches of insulation that you put between you and the ground can mean a much warmer night. Clean, dry, layered sleeping clothes. And that's again where you've got to pick your clothing correctly. Sleeping bag liners. The concepts of silk and fleece liners. Uh, sea to Summit has recently come out with another one and they pack up to packages like this big. They're four different levels. Their third level says they will increase the warmth of your sleeping bag by 25 degrees. I like that. Then you get the radiant double bubble pads. Those are pretty much put out by Hennessy and Hennessy puts them out for uh, Your audio has kind of gone out. <laughs> uh, she's got all the slide presentations so the, the moving but while she fixes so yeah there's you know with this what we're trying to go into here is we're just we're trying to show the differences and and you know and understanding these aren't there's there's various reasons for this some of this stuff's important uh personally i did when i was in the military i did cold weather ops north of the arctic circle twice i got frostbite the first time still to this day i live in houston my feet still get cold um in the summer so uh, it, it happens and we're trying to make people to just to, again, to be aware uh, because, you know, if they go out and they're comfortable in what they're doing as they camp and uh, they move forward, they're more likely to make um, better decisions. And so, you know, which is, which ties to what we're trying to teach people. So we want them to camp and, and, and do better. So, 
Um, Karen, go ahead and move through the next few slides. You can hear me? Yeah, so, I'm here. Yeah, got yeah we just I'm connected oh, again. Hey, and, you, and you're back there. There you are. So. I'm back. This is a whole series of slides that we stick in to explain the physical differences between men and women. We're not going to go through it because there's like eight or 10 slides, but they're really, really cool and interesting. And again, the idea is to educate so people understand the differences because this gets into even things about how women see things differently, how women hear things differently, that it really is important to consider all these physical differences between the genders and to then associate it back to gear facts, to your fabrics, what you choose, and your fabric choices will also tie over into the gear you choose. This one's just kind of fun because it acknowledges that gear was originally designed for men because we were supposed to stay at home and be cooking and cleaning while the guys went out and did their thing. And when women really started doing it and going for their own gear, they just painted it pink and put it back on the market. They didn't take any acknowledgement of all those differences. But and, how important and this it is, is to find gear that fits your body because our torsos are different than a man's torso. Go ahead, Ted. Yeah, no, and this is still true today, guys. It's it, and it's it's known. It's it's that's a marketing gimmick with the pink and things. It, but it truly works because uh, I've done it. I do. If you present something to a guy and it's pink uh, in our scouts, most of them won't want it. If you give it to a girl and it's black, most of them aren't going to want it. I, it's 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 a marketing gimmick. I used to do it with network cables when I worked in technology for a while. Um, and so it is important that they understand that gear, you know, because of those differences, they need to look at different gear and make sure that they have the right gear. General cleaning. We talk about products, about the 200 feet, how you can use just like uh, the Bossman beard, hair and body. It's a great one bar solution that does shampoo, body wash, the works, conditioner, shaving lather, but it has a definitive scent. If I use it at night here at the house, my husband will walk into the bathroom the next morning and go, wow, that smells really good, which means it's a serious smellable, but it's also a seriously compactable article where I'm only carrying one bar of soap as opposed to shampoo, conditioner, body wash. So ethical choices, you gotta figure out what's gonna work for you. Castile soap, palm olive. I'm a firm believer in palm olive. I have the little tiny sample bottles. They're about that big. And it does everything. It stain treats where I spill things on myself. It's good for washing my hands, washing my hair, my body, obviously for washing the dishes. It's a good all over. You don't need a lot to make it work. This is where we would review the quick principles of leave no trace where we would go this, into yeah. the prayer. I was gonna say, this is just where we tie it all together. Yeah, Yep. this this is where we tie it all together. We, we bring all the pieces we've been talking about and bring it back to the seven principles for them. And most everything you see and everything that's talked about, we have an actual article to show them and to let them see and to let them handle. And when we're on the dispose of waste properly and we're showing all of the various female urinary devices. One of the ways we break the ice on that one is we talk about our bodies are our homes, they are our temples. And when God made our bodies, God was smart. He put in a plumbing system and he put the spigot on the outside. And for the guys, he gave them a garden hose and guys can go water the hose. Us, no, he didn't give us a garden hose. He put two pool noodles around the spigot and that's what we get to deal with. And it usually cracks people up enough and lightens the load. And then all of a sudden they don't mind playing with all the devices, but it's really good. They touch them, they play with them and they feel much more comfortable about it. And it stirs conversation, which is one of the main things. Because as you can see, if we just whip through this, we can get through the whole presentation pretty quick. But when we're in person and we're talking with people and we're showing them all these products, this thing stretches out to a good two, three hours. Leave what you find, but understand sometimes you need to leave more, which is our cat holes, picking up other people's trash, campfires. And this ties back again to the biological differences, to the choices of fabrics, and what it takes to be more comfortable in the outdoors. Because if you're cold, you're gonna want them to feed that fire more and more. And you're gonna wanna make that fire bigger so you can get warm. 
where if you're properly prepared and you've made the right choices, you're going to be warm and you're not going to need a bigger fire. Then we can have our leave no trace fires that are smaller and used for the purposes we want them for. Respect wildlife. We really get into the concept with cat holes and make sure you bury everything and bury it well. Make sure your teepee's in there. We joke about squirrels running across trails carrying teepee that's been used. Ugh. Be considerate of other visitors. There's a video that was on YouTube years ago for a woman who devised a belt to wrap around a tree. So when she had to void, she could wrap the belt around the tree and be able to squat without having to strain her legs too terribly much. And in the video, she's all strapped against a tree and leaning back to void. And she's within 15, 20 feet of the nearest trail and she's waving at people. Don't do in their line of seat sight what you don't want to see people do yourselves. And this is where we just open it all to questioning. And we're starting to collect some resources for the last page. So Paula, bring it on. Well, actually, we just got two questions. Uh, one of them is, um, why do women get colder than men? Oh, we can go back and I can pull it up because it's, it's kind of cool. And then the other one is, are there products without fragrance or essential oils? Yes, there are bunches of products on the market without any scents. Um, Castile soap is one of the best insofar as having no scent on there. You just got to watch the labels when you buy the Castile because they also have lavender and they have all of these other amazing scents that we don't need when we're out there. Just read the labeling and double check because sometimes even when they say it's unscented, there's still a scent. What you'll find for a lot of the unscented stuff is if you check um, any place that sells hunting supplies because they're, the unscented is very popular as far as that goes because, you know, again, smellables. And if you're hunting, if you're a hunter, you don't want to be, you know, sniffed out. So that's, that's another area to look. And we have some hunters products that we show when we're out there and they've got, you know, massive bottles of body wash and stuff. So you don't smell, or if you do smell, you smell like a deer. I'm going to slowly scroll through the pages that are physical differences between men and women so you can see them. One of the things we also cover is most of us have seen the air activated hand heaters, the ones you pop out of the bag and you play with them within a few minutes, they start generating heat. They also make them with sticky pads designed for your toes. And most people today, if their torsos are getting cold camping, it's because we have desk jobs and we've sat so long that we're kind of getting rid of the circulation to our posteriors, especially me. I can have hot legs, hot torso, hot arms, and my keister is cold as, uh. If you take those toe ones and you stick them to your lower, lower butt, hold them in place again with your underpants, they will heat your body. And once you heat the coldest parts of your body, the rest of it will start to heat and you'll sleep much better. You just don't sleep well if you're cold. We usually have a very good time talking through these parts cracking jokes like where it says women have larger stomachs. Thank you, God. Like I needed a larger stomach. I don't need enough. Do you mind if I throw in an answer about um, why women get colder? Feel free. Uh, I just went through a section of an anatomy class um, to become a massage therapist. And we talk about the differences between the way that men and women carry their insulation Mm -hmm. um, men are predisposed to having visceral fat. Um, it protects their internal organs, but that's why if you, if you touch a man's belly when he's standing up and he's heavy in the front, it's hard. It's because the fat is underneath the muscle. If you touch a woman's, it's squishy because our muscle is underneath the fat. 
so it has everything to do fat doesn't have circulation in it so no uh, the muscles men, that it's around does men have yep. blood oxygenated blood circling or circulating on top of their insulation and women's is, is hidden underneath so it's harder to keep the skin warm and toasty toes uh, you also have a nerve bed. Those, those are the hand warmers with the sticky on the back. Um, mm -hmm. You have a nerve bed in the back of your neck, right at the top of your back. And if you can sneak those inside your coat, those toasty toes, stick them to the inside of your bottom layer. Um, that helps with that helps with warmth at night too. Yep. Those toasty things are also wonderful for your cell phones and your portable batteries. You put one of those on those devices at night and the cold won't zap the batteries of all their power like it would without them. It'll help to keep the batteries warmer, warmer batteries stay charged longer. Thank you for those add-ins. I have no problem delving into organic chemistry, but I have a hard time delving into visceral fat. Okay, hey, Karen, we have uh, another question. Um, using the female urinary devices, how do you deal with the undergarments? Pull it over. <laughs> Pull it to one side or the other. One of the things I also get into when we're doing this is the choice of undergarments and some of the products I toss around for people are some underwear by a company called, I think it's Kix, and they're menstrual panties. So they're undergarments designed to serve jointly as menstrual pads and underpants. They say that every single set of their underwear will hold three ounces of fluid. So what I did is I bought extra large, just so you'd really be able to see it, sets of thong, granny panties, high hipsters, and one other. And I pass them around and I let people play with them. And they get to see that. The brand that I like that has all the antimicrobial and stays in place, I show people that one and I show it in a different bunch of different formats too, because you have to see what all the undies are and what's really decent and realize that most of the manufacturers who make underwear will also make bras, will also make men's underwear. Oh, we'll get to all those spuds in a moment. Almost there, talking about bears. A question I usually get from men, because men think of the FUDs and they see the oil funnels from playing with cars and stuff like that. And they ask about overflow. And one of the things that apparently a lot of guys don't know about is a woman can start and stop the flow of urine as she wants to. She usually practices this a lot with an exercise called Kegels. And apparently men do not have the ability to start and stop as they wish. Once they get going, they don't stop. Oh, sorry, I had to laugh out loud. It depends on how many children you've had. That too, yes. <laughs> no argument. I, and I this is only a small, go ahead. Go ahead. I added to the chat about um, what do you do about undergarments. I encourage the ladies to wear non-cotton boxer briefs. Um, I learned from a military family member how to use a shiwi, and that's mm -hmm. what they that's what they give the women in the military. And put on some boxer briefs before you go to bed, and practice with your first morning urine in the shower. Yes, heaviest volume, heaviest that pressure, and it's a fail safe way to practice. Yeah, yeah we talk a lot it, when we're in person about getting in the shower and practicing with these devices in the shower. And I readily admit when I'm teaching this that the uh, far bottom left is the one I've used for years. 
And I was actually at a Leave No Trace Master Educator course as a participant. And I put it in backwards and I ended up peeing all over myself like a three-year-old. I had to go change my pants. So make sure you've gotten adjusted to it. The big end is the end that goes in the front, not the skinny end that goes in the back. But this is a small collection of what we toss around and let people play with. The Travel John, Travel Jane, and the Rest Stop all have a poo powder type product inside of them, turning the output into something more biologically inert that the EPA says you can just toss in a landfill. So if you can toss in a landfill, you can toss it in your trash at home. It's similar to the components inside a child's diaper. We got anything else, Paula? Not at this time. All right. Um, does that wrap it up for us then, Paula? Is that Karen? Um, I would like to say, um, of course, thank you to, to Karen and Ted for coming out and giving us this nice presentation. And I would also like to share that we are going to have our um, round tables on the second Wednesday and we're going to try to stick with the second Wednesday from now on. And next month we have the uh, uh, Andrew from the Leave No Trace Center and he's going to talk about where do you find Leave No Trace in your camp. So look forward to that and all of the items that um, Karen has the PowerPoint will be uh, within the next uh, week or so on the website with all of the she has some handouts as well that she is sharing and so that that will be there on the website our outdoor ethics dash bsa.org I want to thank our moderator Matt and Chandra for the collaboration to get all of these wonderful things going for tonight. We also have an evaluation that we'd like you to fill out um, just to, uh, it helps us to know what topics you're interested in hearing about in the future, um, what you thought of this presentation, things that we can improve. Um, the link was just posted in the chat box um, but we will email that out to you as well so that you can go and take that quick survey. Um, and that just helps us improve this program and, and keep it going. Um, if there is nothing else, um, like Paula said, this recording will be posted here pretty soon. Um, and you'll be able to access it uh, whenever you would, would like to. So I think we're finished for the night. Thank you all for coming. Thank you.